We know about induced drag and we also know about parasite drag. What happens when we look at aircraft drag as a whole and combine them to find a value for total drag? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 7 in the Principles of Flight series. Today we're going to be looking at drag again. Induced drag and parasite drag make up different proportions of our total drag depending on the speed we're travelling. In order to fly efficiently, we have to balance these out and find a minimum value for both. Obviously, an understanding of the previous class about drag as well as the class about vortices will help greatly with your understanding of this class. So if you haven't done so, I'd recommend going back and watching them, going through the basic concepts before you come on to the aircraft total drag. When defining drag before, we split it into induced drag and also parasite drag, which consists of skin friction and form drag. Parasite drag also contains another subdivision, which we'll add in now, which is known as interference drag. Interference drag is caused by different flow directions meeting and interfering with one another. When air is flowing over an object, it flows over and around the surface of that object. On an aircraft, there are many different components or objects which all combine together, all with slightly different flow directions. Where these flow directions meet, they cause local vortices, and the energy that causes these vortices is taken away from the aircraft, or it is felt as drag. If we want to reduce the amount of interference drag, then we try to avoid any sudden change in flow direction at any sort of corners. So we add in something known as filleting, which is something that smooths out the joints in between the different objects, such as this. Fillets are not structural, but are only there to help to reduce the interference drag by creating this sort of gradual change between the different flow directions. Now we know all the parts that make up parasite drag, let's apply the concept to an actual aircraft. If we look at a graph of parasite drag against speed, we can see that it increases with speed, it actually varies according to the speed squared. This is because the drag of an aircraft is given as a half rho v squared times SCD. In our case, when we're only looking at the parasite drag, we don't use coefficient of drag, we use coefficient of drag parasitic, so CDP. If we add elements to increase our parasite drag, such as flaps or landing gear, we will change our coefficient of parasitic drag and alter our graph so that more drag is experienced sooner. We essentially get the graph moving up and left, looking something like this. This is a concept we use in the real world a lot when reducing speed for coming in for approach, for example. Basically, the effect of extending flaps or gear when travelling faster will help you slow down quickly, whereas when you extend the flaps when you're slower, the effect will be far less effective. The difference between the clean and flap drag is greatest when we're at higher speeds. So if you compare this point here of the clean aircraft and the flaps extended, if you look at a speed here, the difference in drag isn't very great, but if you come all the way up here and you're traveling faster, the difference in drag is quite substantial. So this is why um, the flaps and the dropping of the gear is much more effective at high speeds to slow the aircraft down. In order to reduce parasitic to drag, we can just travel slower. Or on the design side of things, we avoid you know, rough surfaces to reduce our skin friction drag, and we avoid some sharp changes in direction and add in filleting to stop out those flow changes and that interference drag that we talked about earlier. An easy way to explain induced drag, again, is with a graph. As you can see, it's the opposite case to parasitic drag. It decreases as we get faster. This is something we learned about in the class about vortices. Basically, when we travel slower, the air has more time to be disturbed by the wing passing through it, and therefore we get stronger vortices, 
more downwash and a larger induced angle attack, which means our reaction force is a greater proportion of drag than it is lift. Another aspect we looked at in the class about vortices that affects the strength of them is the strength of the pressure differential. And for the same aircraft, but heavier weight, we're gonna be needing more of a pressure differential to counteract that heavier weight. To create this larger pressure differential and a larger amount of lift, the aircraft must have a faster speed and a larger angle of attack. This means that when compared to the lighter aircraft, the amount of induced drag is always greater in relation to the speed. Essentially, what I'm saying with this is a heavier graph will push the graph up and to the right like this. So you get something like that. This would be a heavy aircraft and this line would be for the light. So as you can see, for a heavier aircraft, you always are gonna be producing more lift and because you're producing more lift and more of that pressure differential, then you will have a larger amount of induced drag at all points along the graph. So I said before that the induced drag is the opposite case to parasitic drag and it drops off as speed increases. This does require a bit of further explanation because if you look at the drag equation, it does appear that it's the same case as parasitic drag. It varies by V squared. Why is it inverted? It doesn't seem to make any sense. So to dive a bit deeper into the coefficient of induced drag, we'll talk about the relationships between it, the aspect ratio and the coefficient of lift. So when we looked at the wing design class, we saw that high aspect ratios are good for reducing induced drag. So we can say that induced drag varies indirectly with aspect ratio. Aspect ratio goes up, our induced drag goes down, or if our aspect ratio goes down, our induced drag goes up. Induced drag is also dependent on how much lift we have. So it's basically dependent on the coefficient of lift. And the relationship between these two is that coefficient of induced drag varies directly with the coefficient of lift squared. So if we combine them, we get that the coefficient of induced drag varies with the coefficient of lift squared over the aspect ratio. This is a very important relationship between coefficient of drag and these two elements. So if we look at the way our coefficient of induced drag varies along with our lift and drag equations, we can figure out why this relationship exists. So we're gonna look at a few points along our graph and look at the lift equations for each point. So if we look at you know a slow speed here. So we have a slow speed here. Our speed is down, which means that if we want to fly straight and level, for instance, we'll have to have a high coefficient of lift because in order to maintain a lift level, we have a slow speed, something else has to go up, this coefficient of lift will go up. We know that if the coefficient of lift goes up, our coefficient of induced drag goes up because our aspect ratio is unchangeable once the wing is actually designed. So this makes sense. If we're flying at a slow speed, it means our coefficient of lift goes up and our coefficient of induced drag varies according to CL squared, so it'll be very high, which makes sense here. If we go further down and look at this point here, for instance, and write down our lift equation, we're traveling at a high speed. So our speed is really high which means that we don't need a large coefficient of lift or a high angled attack, for example. That means that our coefficient of lift goes down, and when our coefficient of lift drops down, this aspect ratio won't change in any way, but it does mean that our coefficient of induced drag reduces, which is why we can see our induced drag coefficient is reduced down here. So this is the reason why it seems to vary according to one over V squared because it's the relationship of the coefficient of lift changing in proportion to the speed that actually influences the coefficient of drag. So let's look at both parasite and induced drag together 
If we plot them together, we get our induced drag coming down like this and our parasitic drag coming up like that. Our total drag is very simply just the coefficient of, or correction, our coefficient of drag total is just the coefficient of drag parasitic plus the coefficient of drag induced. So you basically add these two lines together and end up with a U shape that looks something like this. From this graph, we can see some interesting points. At the very bottom of the graph here is our best combination of both induced and parasitic drag. This is our minimum drag speed, something we call VMD, velocity minimum drag. This is the speed where the least drag is experienced and therefore the least amount of thrust is needed to overcome that drag. Thrust and drag have to be equal to each other in order to maintain a steady speed in level flight. So this means that we can get away with using a lot less thrust and it means that therefore there's a lot less fuel burnt. Another interesting point we can see on the graph is something known as speed stability. If we are traveling at this speed, for example, on this right side of the total drag curve, an external factor such as a gust of headwind will slow us down. The drag actually goes down at that point. So if we maintain the same thrust setting, then the aircraft will accelerate because now there will be more thrust than there is drag. The opposite is also true. If we speed up for any external reason, the drag will increase. And if we maintain the same thrust setting, then the drag force will be larger than the thrust force and it will decelerate to the point where the forces are then balanced again. The whole region to the right of the lowest point or higher than VMD is known as the speed stable region, as any disturbances without any changes in thrust will always return to that initial condition. The whole region to the left of VMD is conversely speed unstable. If we're traveling at this speed, and we get a gust of headwind that slows us down, the drag actually increases. And if we don't adjust the thrust, then the drag force will be larger than the thrust and we'll continue to slow down and slow down and slow down. If we don't do anything, we can eventually get to such a slow speed that we stop. If we speed up for some external factor, then the drag will reduce. And if we don't adjust the thrust, we will exceed the drag and we will continue to speed up. So this whole region to the left is known as the speed unstable region. This region is also often referred to as the back of the drag curve. If you get slow in the back of the drag curve, you'll need a large amount of thrust to return to your target speed. When flying at a slow speed, such as approach to landing, you're flying within this back of the drag curve region. So monitoring speed is essential and constant thrust adjustments are needed as the speed can back diverge quickly, we could end up in a slow speed stall situation. At my company and many others, we add a minimum correction, which in my company is five knots, um, to our approach speed in order to increase where we are or move our level up in the drag curve. And it means that the differences are much lower. You can see it's shallower here. So if you're within this sort of region, the increases in drag are much less severe Whereas if you're here, you reduce by like one knot, you could end up with way more drag or you increase by one knot, you could end up with much less drag. There are a few factors that affect the look of our total drag curve, some of which we saw before in the individual parasite and induced drag graphs. And the total drag graph is essentially a projection of those factors. So we saw that by increasing the form drag, the one that bears directly with V squared, that it pushed the graph up to the left like this. So essentially you project that forward onto the total drag curve and you would end up with something with a line coming down here, but then the line would pop up much sooner. When we looked at increasing the weight of an aircraft, the induced drag curve moved up and to the right. So if we project that forward onto the total drag curve, we would end up with a line that is influenced by the weight, which would come down a lot greater than that original line. 
Another factor that will influence the total drag curve is altitude. At a lower air density, aka higher up in the atmosphere, there are fewer molecules. So we have to be traveling faster to produce the correct amount of lift. That's as long as the wing design stays the same. Because induced drag only exists when we create lift, it means that induced drag will only start being produced at this higher speed. The theory also applies for parasite drag. Fewer molecules mean the, effect, the effects are not felt until traveling at this faster speed. Basically, what this means is that the total drag curve moves to a higher speed. So you would get both lines moving over and you wouldn't experience drag until you're actually traveling faster. Earlier we broke down the drag equation into two parts, one for the parasitic drag and the other for induced. As the coefficient of drag is just the induced drag plus the parasite drag, that means that we can just combine them together uh, very simply and use the one drag equation. To summarize then, we now know that drag is made of induced and parasite drag, and parasite drag is form, skin friction, and interference drag. Interference drag is caused by the differing flow directions where the objects interact, and these cause local forces and disturbances in the airflow. The energy from those comes from the energy of the aircraft, and that is experienced as drag. In order to reduce those, we add in fillets, which are little areas which smooth out those rough transitions and they are not structural. Parasite drag varies with V squared. It goes up with V squared. And if we are clean, it's like this. And if we add in flaps or ear to make us dirty, uh, it increases our form drag a lot and also the skin friction drag. So we'll experience more drag sooner. It essentially pushes the graft up and to the left. With induced drag, it's the opposite case. It reduces according to V squared. It varies with one over V squared. And if we are heavier, it moves us up and to the right because we need more lift. And that means that our induced drag would be higher as well. So we experience something like this for a heavy versus light. When we combine induced drag and parasitic drag together, we come up for a graph for total drag. The point at the very bottom is the lowest of our induced drag, sorry, lowest of our parasitic drag and our induced drag. And that speed there is known as VMD, velocity minimum drag. The region to the right of VMD is our speed stable region as any disturbances will cause a increase in drag or reduction in drag that is appropriate to get us back to that original speed. To the left of VMD, we have speed unstable region, otherwise known as the back of the drag curve. Any disturbances to our speed externally will cause a reduction or an increase in drag that actually takes us further away from our starting speed. Any increase in the parasitic drag, such as flaps or landing gear, along with any increase in the weight, will influence the total drag curve. Basically, by projecting forward these changes, it'll make either the section to the right steeper and sooner, or the section to the left a bit steeper and sooner. When we increase in altitude, we basically experience this drag curve at a later point, so it'll shift horizontally to the right. So combining everything together from these graphs simply, we can just write that our coefficient of drag is equal to the coefficient of induced drag plus the coefficient of parasitic drag.